Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. We have an outstanding poet, writer, who is in the New York area. I met her through a series of presentations that we've done on poets, starting with the Lake Como group. Uh, thank you for um, Golden Foothills Press, uh, Dr. Thelma Reyna, who put us together. And I was able to hear her poetry, be moved by it. And then obviously the question became, what motivated her to write? So today we have her as a guest. We want to thank her for coming. And uh, we want to reflect on the idea that she's sitting outside with no snow from that area, which is normally typically very cold. I've been up there in the Ithaca area. So thank you for being with us, doctor. Um, when did you start writing, Carolyn? Uh Writing poetry was what started me uh, probably about nine years old. Nine. nine years old, eight or nine. Yeah. Is, is this something people do because they feel a need to write poetry or is this something persons are taught to do and they sort of start evolving in it? Well, I think that every child has poetry. Uh, it's a sense of wonder. And yeah, my mom was a poet and her grandmother used to recite poetry with her. So it sort of skipped along generations. You kept it up then? Yeah, uh, yeah. My mother is a great poet and uh, she didn't criticize my poetry <laughs> too harshly. <laughs> now you're, uh, I'm gonna read a little bit of your background. Uh, you were born in Ithaca, New York. You often lived abroad. You studied classics in Cornell, Brown and John Hopkins. And you have a huge array of books. And I'm very, very honored to have a series of them, which we'll talk about. And I know you have some more. We're going to talk about your book. The idea of being a poet. Um, the one, the one, you know, what usually people that I run into are always thinking about my job. You know, what kind of a job am I going to have or something? And I've never thought of the idea of a person saying, I'm a poet. Is that a, a career? Is that a hobby? Or is that sort of something one does in between? How, how does yeah. that all mesh together? That's great. It's a great subject of comedy, too. I can't remember the name of the movie. You might remember, but there was a cocktail party and someone introduced herself as a poet. And they said, what? And they said, no, really, I am. I'm a poet. Uh, the woman was, you know, obviously a well-known poet to somebody. But uh, nobody thinks that's possible. But all poetry means, it goes back to the Greek word poesis. Poesis means to make. So I'm a maker. Uh, I make things. And instead of making quilts or music, I try to make poetry. Um, that's what we do. And I don't try to make a living at it. So most what? people who are poets um, understand the urge to make is a creative gift. Uh, so we go for it. Uh, when we can. I remember once being with a session with high school students and I said, you know, are anybody here are poets? They said, no, I was teaching uh, political science at the time. And uh, I shared, I said, you know, does anybody here listen to poetry? And everybody looked at each other and says, no, it's sort of a strange face. I said, every song is a poet. If you listen carefully, you realize that they're saying poetry to you. And then the students started to evolve. And I said, that is a profession to write you know, music. But uh, it always caught my attention as well that we find poetry in places we don't know that it's there. And yet the consciousness of poets is always around us. And we're very grateful for that. What Thank made you. you decide to be a, a professor? I wanted to finish my PhD, which I started in 1983 with a master's from Brown University, had a hiatus to have three children, uh, family obligations to help support. In many ways, it was mutual. So I think uh, I always wanted to be a professor. My parents were in education. My father was a professor. My sister was a professor. So why not fall from that tree? <laughs> what was your most... Uh memorable time of you know being a professor and you probably have thousands of memories but you know which one stands out in your mind today 
I, I know that I was an adjunct. Don't, don't call me a professor. That's a title you have to earn very, very hard, hard and long to get tenure and all. So I was only an adjunct for a while. But actually, some of the most fond memories I had was in Athens, Georgia, working for the classics department there for a year. Um, so that was a beautiful time um, in my life, um, riding my bicycle into work. I was young enough to look like an undergraduate, <laughs> but I could step up to the podium and uh, deal with the challenges that came along with it um, from the students. Sometimes they would uh, challenge me, shall we say. Um, but it was fun. Mythology. You you mentioned the word before, and I know you mentioned uh, the idea, and it's in your bio that you know you really love mythology. Could you tell us a little bit about what you find so special about it, and you know why? Yeah, and and just now, like I hear the wind chimes are churning. Perhaps you noticed that noise in the background. They're beautiful. They're beautiful. Uh, thank you. That's a little mythology right there. Zephyr, the spring wind. Zephyr. Uh, the, the, the Greek term, Z-E-P-H-Y-R. Uh, I grew up uh, in Ithaca with my parents, a name like Ithaca uh, prospers uh, mythology. Also went to ski at the Greek peak ski area. It's called the Greek peak ski area where every mountain run had a different Greek name, um, like the Zephyr or Marathon, or even now recently Hercules is a new run. So, I still teach skiing there in my retirement and I love it. Um, so mythology is just something you find everywhere. Um, when you pick up a pen and it flows, you thank the muse. Or if you go out in the woods and you hear the xylophone bird, uh, I call it the wood thrush. It's a sense of, of awe uh, that is nature. Um, so that's where it comes from for me and the stars, looking up at the stars when we can see them. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I have a professor here in front of me, and you know, I, I I'm going to ask you that question as a as a student, as a student. Why why is mythology still relevant today? I think it's the the vox aeterna that that is the the eternal voice uh, for every culture. Uh, what what means something to a Native American uh, subculture, other types of uh, mythology all reflect their eternal uh, uh, psychoses, if you will. We all have issues in every culture, beautiful and terrible, and sometimes both. So we can look at mythology and say and express things that maybe only psychology has been able to do in the modern world. And those stories help people understand and externalize their family, their problems, uh, society's challenges, nature, the destructive side of man and woman. It's all there uh, for, for the keeping. You just reminded me uh, of a period of time when I was very, very uh, consistent on reading Joseph Campbell. Oh, and, uh, great job. And I didn't understand the depth of mythology until I sort of touched his books. And then I started to evolve, you know, learning from there. So, and uh, my son was applying to med school at that time. And he says, dad, I'm preparing for my entrance exam for med school. And I said, great, you know, can I borrow your Joseph Campbell books? And I sat back and I thought, okay, I'm now I'm totally confused. And it was a long story <laughs> about that. But he says mythology is very important in, in medicine. And I thought, okay, well then I'm really not seeing the whole picture, but I, you, that's why I became interested in asking you that question. Oh, so, he's so right, Asclepius. Asclepius, the uh, God who gave the Hadoukius to uh, doctors, those symbols of the twin snakes wrapped around the staff that comes out of a story of Asclepius and the skin of the snake is shed yearly in a sense of positive regrowth and survival. So that may have been related to the doctors of the ancient Greek times applying the mythology of Asclepius to their profession. Wow. And it's not only a story of, uh, like you say, uh, the drama of humans, but it's also very ethical. 
It asks mm -hmm. us to look at our ethics and analyze them, i.e. doctors or lawyers or whatever, where we end up with ethics. So mm -hmm. it's just something we're now we're into this very fascinating of mythology. To go back to your poetry, is there a sort of a, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure you have 20, 30 books. I mean, I have a collection oh, of well, poetry. No. I, I, I have only been publishing books since 2014. Really? You. Yeah. Oh, wow. Do you find that there's a common theme amongst all of them, or is there certain major themes that sort of keep crossing your path over and over? Again? I I think me, <laughs> the word would be me. <laughs> it sounds like egotistical, but I have very uh, simple. I strive to be simple in poetry, and so I don't um, cloak my poems very well. Um, there's not a lot of stealth. It's quite open. So it should be an easy read. I want to make it accessible. So all and my poems should be accessible to people of all ages. Is there and a readers is, of all experience levels? Is there a common theme you want to get across through your poetry? Uh yeah, I think I do. I think uh simplicity uh is more than just a pattern. Um we used to make dresses as kids out of this simplicity uh, patterns, they were called. Um, you you try to cut your dress pattern based on these tissues. You'd lay everything out and pin it and cut it and then sew it together. And a lot of seamstresses do that. So my grandmother was a seamstress for a while here in the region of Elmira and Ithaca, actually. She had to make a living when her husband, who was a farmer here in Elmira, died. I learned all this simple, simple stuff, um, knitting, uh, sewing, all the things that I had to do young as simple tasks. And that's what poetry should be too. It has to come from the heart and from maybe the hearth too. I'm kind of domestic, I would say. Uh, as much as I've traveled, I still love home. So that's a theme, simple home. <laughs> simple home do do poets I, I this is a very broad question i may be asking it wrong but i'll ask anyway is no there is there an intent to move the readers toward a direction and toward understanding something or is it just simply poetry to share one's feelings with others and saying well however it hits on you you know mm -hmm. let it evolve no, I think every poet who's worked long enough knows they're on a mission uh, of sorts. Uh, a mission not to make someone see the world that you see the same way, but a mission to, to instill empathy and hope. Um, as much as people say, oh, sometimes poetry is just therapy. I don't use it that way because I don't want to share every one of my darkest moments. I figure there's plenty of that to go around. So I do have the kind of thing of like not to be Pollyannish, which is overly optimistic, but I do believe most of my poems reflect a resilience that we all need to tap in ourselves as adapting to life and uh, keeping hopeful. Tell us about your books share a little bit oh, about them. Well, you know, they all kind of had a birthing order. So I'll just tell you briefly, the two that I have here that I, I've used in readings, um, and I might read one today is Nemosyne and Choose Lethe. Nemosyne means, oh, hey, look at that. Hey. <laughs> so they are fin finishing line press uh, chat books. And uh, they are really um, twins in a sense that one was 2014 and one was actually 2013, December, and uh, the other was uh, 2017, but they were bookends, actually bookends more than <laughs> twins. <laughs> um, but they both choose uh, mythology as their vehicle. Then before that, I had this poem uh, book that I'm probably going to do more with. This is a manuscript called Amish Mimesis, which means imitation. 
uh, but it's the ancient Greek word for imitating. It's a theory of, of poetry and of making and doing. To copy uh, is to, to praise in its greatest sense. So when we built our home, I wrote this book with photographs to show the different stages of the, the build. The Amish did not want me to film or take photos. So I made sure I didn't put them in the photos um, unless they just happened to be on the roof or something like that. I think there's one that shows them. It's a black and white, but it's really helpful because it opened up a whole new world for me. This manuscript uh, was more than just a house build. So I'd like to turn it into a real book as part of the one I'm working on now. I've had two years to write poems that are unpublished. I'm savoring them and then I'm going to reweave them with this little manuscript that my local friend Judy Swan, another poet, helped me to produce. It was produced on a Xerox machine oh, at wow. uh, Cornell. Uh, so it's not really officially published, has no ISBN number. Mm. So it would likely be, it's called the Espresso Machine and it would be an adventure <laughs> to, to bring it together. I like that term. <laughs> yeah. the, the one I wanna talk about most though is Newfoundland with Cayuga Lakes books. And that's the one uh, that you have too. I, yes, I made yes. sure that you would enjoy reading that. Excellent. And that's the collection. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the collection that um, thankfully Judy and Peter Fortunato and others have written on the back, um, my friends from Maryland uh, recognized this was my life work uh, that had kept under a basket. Uh, light that you put under a basket usually lights on fire. And there's a Testament that says, don't put your light under a basket. That's from the New Testament somewhere. Mm. So I learned at the time that I'd been holding back my poetry for a lifetime. When I retired, it all came pouring out and that's where I started publishing. So this is an independent press, but it's got a great website and a little bit about me there. So that's the one Cayuga Lake books. I'm very grateful for. Um, most recently, the last I'll talk about is the poet duet. Thank you. <laughs> poet duet uh, comes straight from my mom and me weaving together in her latest years. Um, she was in her 90s together the poems of her lifetime and mine. I chose them to make them reflect a mother and daughter tangentially, just tangentially our poems touched one another by chance very often, um, not deliberately, but it's a great voice to share when one has a mother as wonderful as I had. Florence Clark, a published poet and writer um, that I'll always be indebted to. Absolutely. That's. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping we have the honor of having you read a poem to us. Well, that would be a real honor for me to, to compete with the wind chimes. And, uh, <laughs> That's all right. I think it adds ambience. That. I think it adds <laughs> to it, you know. Well, I'll start with the, po the poem that uh, I wrote um, basically for my father and brother. Uh, a long time ago, we all used to ski together. And this was a memory of going to a mountain where you could touch three countries at once, Italy, France, and Switzerland. And I later found out it was on Mount uh, Dole, Doleo, I think it's called D-O, or maybe it's D-O-L-E-N-T, I forget. But I was very young at the time. It's called The Long Traverse, Icarus, The Ascent. Ridge walking deep fields of mountain fresh snow, now my dreamscape. Once was a trust inherited patronymic. Together we could span three countries, France, Italy, Helvetica, joined at this peak as we opened our pinnacle feast of Appenzell and wine before descending. Then there was cause to celebrate ascending the pass, all those steps of disbelief, while sealskins braced our reach for buttermilk skies. Two buttermilk skies for my grandfather Clark at age 55 in World War II parachuted with Red Cross behind enemy lines. Granddad had named those mountains clouds of Alaska, but you drank the stuff for breakfast before circling the backfield that was your trekking ground. 
That's where I first heard Granddad say clouds were called that way. Nor was it the last time he'd tell a story just the same. 1906, how his water hauling cart had reeled down blistering streets while the earth shook San Francisco's fresh rubble. Steel frames were all that withstood that ordeal, all that the fires could not lick and horse sweat trickled off his reins while a man offered water to the injured exiles who circled for days like Eskimo dogs. Three, Daedalus, the descent. For dad, who taught us balance and downhill speed till age 91. Such a long traverse it was, this upward grazing on frostbit rock, an inroad into a wilderness of understanding. Learn when to trust a gull's cornice, or how to leap down steps of windblown waves, how to see through this shroud of white past tree line. Three miles down, stale bread becomes our pilgrim clutch and sweat has frozen to our backs when suddenly night lights up the high peaks. Initial belief unfolds to conch shell learning. The world three quarters quartz <laughs> needs cirrus to wake a frozen rainbow. Just so our faith, transparent, reappears below with the bubbling of a crystal brook running, running home. <laughs> it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I've, you got got to, I've got to ask. I've got to ask. I've got to go back to the question uh, uh, again, your background as a professor. Um, there are individuals in the world that um, were thinking about be, writing their poetry and have issues about that. Is that a beer you're drinking? Uh, it's a beer with a good cover on it. It's called Grassroots Music. Oh, cool. I'm gonna have to try that next time I'm that side of town. <laughs> it's the festival cooler holder, but That's it's a cool. local beer, very oh, lightweight. You guys make good wines too. I've had wines from that area as well. So we'll, oh, get yeah. that. we'll, we'll go we back to that. We got a little bit of everything <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> Let me go back to the question. Um, so there are individuals who are thinking are writers, but they're hidden. They they feel fear of sharing their work. What and they're you, done that. Where, what's what's your advice to those individuals? Get out, you know. Get out. Uh, don't be afraid. Life never got you anywhere being afraid to share, and take your personal thoughts and say, that's what makes them so special. So don't try to be like anyone else, be yourself and share. There's a very strong tie between psychology and mythology and poetry writing. This is, and much more, of course, the, the rich field of literature and just it's so consuming, but it's so positive. It gives a sense of hope and relief. And I've, I felt that in my own life, being around individuals like yourself. Before we let you go, please, can you give us a website where people can find you or write to you or learn more about your work, please? Yeah, actually, I'm listed two places. I don't have my own website. I'd rather write than spend time marketing. So little by little, I'll get known. Um, I'm known as a Newfield poet. If you look that up and Google Newfield poet, it does come up with an interesting article. But the real website would be, the best would be Cayuga Lake Books. And that would be the one that's associated with the poems of Newfound Land. Okay. And Cayuga Lake Books has a, a, a good bio and an interview on me uh, and other writers who are from Ithaca and doing a lot for this area. It's a great uh, people oriented, uh, website and then there's another one called poets and writers where i hang my bio and there's a video on that that you would love from buffalo street books a very well produced video of my reading um uh in buffalo street books bookstore a few years ago so enjoy that um poets and writers has that uh on my link carolyn clark your closing words 
It's a great honor to be here, uh, a real pleasure to be here with you, Armando, and you've done so much for the writers of the West Coast and across the world, um, the videos you produce of quality and taking your time to interview those who are colleagues with Thelma Reyna, um, and we thank her also, and Golden Hills Press. We welcome you to come back to our program and have, give us and share with us more of your stories and share with us your insights about how mythology affects, impacts all of us and how you continue to integrate it into your writing. So um, I'm going to go, I travel quite a bit to the Mediterranean even now, my wife and I, so you've sort of alerted me that I need to learn even more and appreciate it more and prepare myself before we go there as well. So wonderful. You. Well, I do hope you enjoy the, the reading that helps the imagination to reach your goal. Uh, it means so much to travel when you have uh, time to research it as we all have had during this time. Wonderful. Enjoy. And, and I'll Enjoy. refer back to you when I have questions and I said, well, I didn't understand that. Now I have someone, an expert. Yeah, oh, better than sure. me, better than me about learning all this, but. Oh, but no. And I, I, I understand you have quite a lot to share also. So someone's got to turn the camera on you next time. Uh, I will lend myself as you have as well. I'd be honored to do that. So we look forward to it. Great. Take care. All right. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking to Dr. Carolyn Clark, who alerts us that poetry is not just something on a book. It stimulates our creativity, our mind. It gives us a sense of hope. And I have to say for myself, having met so many poets through Dr. Thelma Reyna and others, uh, you have the ability of putting our feelings into words that we ourselves are not always aware of. And you help us to come up to a level of understanding ourselves a lot more. And I think it's not necessarily you're trying to get us to go in a certain direction, but you're getting us to look at our own hearts and our own souls and come to grips with the life. So I want to thank you for that. And uh, I know you're a, a horse rider. Your horses are in the back. So I know you may be off to riding your horse or just came back, but continue. Just came back. Thank you. So continue. <laughs> Gratitude. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.